we've been recording for like five minutes, but Oh. I need to count. <laughs> yeah, yeah, five, four. One. One. What's up, guys? D and D. Intro. Who's doing the intro? Um Chief labeled this Nerd Apocalypse End of Year Edition 2022 podcast. I read it backwards. Wait. That he had the title. That was read backwards. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, should we start with, like, like and subscribe based on the content they haven't seen yet? Yes, like and subscribe. <laughs> Click that like button. <laughs> Smash yeah. it. Smash it. Beast it. All right. So, anyway, actual intro. Jake, Brian, Shaw. Apparently, we're talking about whatever. Jake, you put this together? I kind of. Like, I put, like, a shell of it together. So, Jake put it together. So, if you don't like the questions, that's on him. Mm, congratulations. We're apparently if talking you, about If you D. don't like our answers, it's also on Jake. That's fair. That's true. That's so, like totally discussing D and D board games, God tier video games, some rank lists, and some goals. I don't have goals. You know, we know. Yeah, for that's one five years. <laughs> um. So anyway, we'll get into it and go with the D and D crazy character concepts that we have heard of, have done, or want to try. I really want to do a divine rogue, like a rogue that has cleric or paladin. You know, in three. 3035, they had that, the Black Flame Zealot. Mm -hmm. It was actually a pretty cool character. I haven't seen it adapted. Did it smite? No, but they did get like a bunch of. At least I don't think so. I know that they got some bonus damage, and I know that like high levels when they killed people, they couldn't be resurrected because they basically got claimed by their god already. Mm -hmm. He did one of Hades. It was actually a really cool concept. Is that what. What was your character's name? Bastion. Bastion. Bastion was his cohort. cohort. Yeah, and that's who was the Black Flame Zealot. Yeah. Running, yeah, running leadership with leadership. Yeah, <laughs> with leadership. so old school, older versions of D and D where everything was broken. It worked out pretty well, but I actually liked that concept a lot. I mean, it's like two things that don't. It's like a yin and yang. It's two things that usually don't go well together, but it's like a divine assassin. So I do feel like this is a specific call out to a player that we played with who played a rogue. And did such a shit job of it that Jake never got that fulfilled because Jake was playing a paladin who was in charge of things and he had this other player who was a rogue who was supposed to take care of all the things that the paladin felt were morally outside of his realm. The rogue was supposed to handle them. But the rogue, yes, exactly. Put the fucking blinders on and then, hey, I don't have to worry about Force it. Force blinders. The, the problems just go away. The problem is that character playing that rogue did such a shit job at everything he ever fucking did. I'm gonna make that a we deal never... with the people that are killing my organization. Yeah. <laughs> no, kill them. Well, you phrased it perfectly because this particular character, he found a way to lose control of every situation he was in. Mm -hmm. One of my perfect favorites was the party was like level 17, 18 at the time. They stole this senator from a city that's based off of Rome, so it's a Roman senator. They get him on a boat. This guy's a level zero NPC that just has some social skills and nothing more. They begin questioning him, and the senator begins bullying this rogue. The rogue is level 17. He can literally one-shot this guy, and he starts bending over backwards and being like, oh, I really fucked up. They're gonna like, Guys, you can literally level the whole town at this point. This is the end of the campaign. There's nobody who can stand up to you except for a few, like, the big bad guy and a few NPCs. And the senator. And apparently the fucking senator. Yeah. Eventually somebody somebody else in the party said, we're going to solve this, slit his throat and threw him overboard. You're on the precipice of godhood. Yeah. Like and, the senator and you literally captured, one. you kidnapped this guy, you got him on a boat, <laughs> away from all of his friends, nobody, he, it's like completely isolated, and the rogue loses control of the situation. It's just, he has confidence issues. He has it's confidence 17. issues. You know, at least he was consistent throughout the whole campaign. Yeah. With the confidence <laughs> issues and losing control of situations. Maybe he was so in character he didn't even realize. You called it, it out as a character trait to lose control yeah. of situations, and it wasn't supposed to be. It was the player just did that. Yeah, yeah. That is but just jumping off from that and redirecting back towards what you were saying, religious striker or religious rogue, for he also had the Avenger, which I oh, yeah. guess you could consider semi-rogue-esque because a lot of the skills that they had were, you know, fall under, like... Is that Deception. Like a paladin? Stealth. But they also were part of the divine class of power rankings, and they were a striker. So I think if Wizards of the Coast could bring something back like that, where maybe it's not specifically a rogue, it could be... But just oh, I guess like it could that. be a subclass of the rogue. Yeah, because yeah. like 100%. Arcane Trickster, basically. I mean, they already have a divine barbarian. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. The... Yeah, it wouldn't be a question because, like, arcane trickster. It's a it's a rogue that has arcane talents. So jumping back to any other crazy character concepts, because that's a very good one that I do like. 
yeah, it's one that I've I've thought about time and time again. But in the current rule set, it's it's weird on how you would do it. I think. Yeah. I think it's harder under five E rule set to make a you like a like a crazier concept like if we go back to fourth edition, you could create a warlock who casts all of his spells with like the constitution stats. So you could be like a bulk lock, which I've seen yeah. before, yeah. which I absolutely love. Or the sorcerer that does dex and just runs around stabbing everybody and channeling lightning through yes. it. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. I feel 5e like with not as... subclasses and how the classes are laid out in 5e, you can't you can't experiment in that sense, but it more comes from, you know, how many different classes can I pour into this character to create something truly unique? Which always feels min maxy to me, which mm -hmm. I'm not always about. Now, I will say one of the character concepts that I <laughs> didn't know existed that I am trying is in Frostmaiden, where it's I am cleric sorcerer. Mm. Yeah. And it is working very well, being a, uh, a storm cleric and taking uh, the thunder sorcery. Yeah, because you're basically playing a pirate who also like pays homage to the gods of the sea and the yep. storms. Yep, yep. Which and makes perfect it sense. It's working. That class seems to be working very well. And, and it's I like... annoying as a DM because when you got, when you want to attack the sorcerer who's you know 10, 20 feet off the ground, mm -hmm. you don't have many options. But I do like that partially because like not only did you multi class two things that wouldn't normally I wouldn't normally look at and say they fit together, but you did it in a way that makes sense character wise. Mm -hmm. rather than, hey, I'm a paladin who read a book in a deep, dark library, and now I've got two levels of warlock for some fucking reason. Or min-maxing. Yeah, like, which is what people do yeah. with the paladin warlock thing. I'm all, if you want to do crazy concepts like that, even if you want to min-max it, as long as you like build a character around it and like have that personality and this is supporting it, rather than, hey, here's a way I can do the most damage possible in one hit. So, yeah. Um, I do have a couple of like monks that I wanted to do. I did want to do a um, complete degenerate monk. Basically, he grew up in the, um, what do you call it? Grew up in a church or grew up in a very strict lawful environment. And now that he's out, he's just a drunken wastrel all the time. <laughs> so he still has all the physical abilities, but just like, hey, yeah, I was in this, basically, he turned into a rebellious teen. I was in this oppressive environment. And now that I have all this discipline, guess what I want to do? I want to go drink and party and fuck around and kill people because it'd be fun. Right. Could possibly even go in like the assassin route. Did three five have a drunken monk? There was like yeah. a drunken monk class, and five e doesn't, to my knowledge. And I don't even care about doing a drunken monk specifically. I just more like the idea of like, obviously, drink is a perfect example of a vice, but a somebody who's just very reactionary against that environment. Because mm -hmm. most of the time, I see monks. Well, excluding you playing monks. Um, most of the time I see monks, they tend to like follow a little bit more of that regimented discipline, and I just wanted to do something different. You do fucking Thunder Thunderfist, who's a mm -hmm. fucking drunken dwarf monk that fuck everybody, and then Soleil, who's, well, Soleil. Opposite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Opposite. Pretty lawful in his own right. Yeah. I think, I think that brings up a really good <clears throat> aspect of 5th edition, though, in that they don't have alignment restrictions on a lot of different classes. And I think that really created even though it, you didn't necessarily need to follow your backstory with the alignment i feel like in 3.5 when they had alignment based classes like paladins always had to be lawful monks always had to be lawful you get a very certain type of character yeah. every time they're played which is why we threw those rules out though mm -hmm. it's like you i don't feel like that has to be a necessity you can do more creative shit even if you're not, the, I mean, I don't want to go too far the other way. I don't want to go the super, like, anti-trope of just, like, hey, I'm a barbarian that hits people with a spell book and thinks he's a mage. It's like, ah, I've heard that one a dozen times at yep. this point. I don't really want to, I don't really want that in a group. It's kind of annoying. But. What other concepts? Do we have any other concepts? I, you know, I don't think I have anything in the back pocket. I tend to build characters based on what I want to do in the in the world itself. So, <laughs> there, a lot of times I'm not, what I, what I find myself doing if I have characters in my in my like back pocket, while I'm playing characters, I want to play the characters I have in my back pocket. So I can't think about what I want to play because <laughs> yep. I'm going to get away from what I'm actually playing. So. And then you're okay letting your character die. Yep. That being said, from a DM standpoint, I personally always recommend if you've kind of got that, then let's either do some like one shots or let's retire your character for a couple sessions, get it out of your system, realize the grass may or may not be greener, and then you can come back to right. it. Uh, that being said, if you're like, if you've got 12 character concepts and every other session you're changing, I'm going to tell you to go fuck yourself. <laughs> um, on that, with that, the talking of the Black Flame Zealot, mm -hmm. moving into the next thing here of the changes with 5e, 5e. 
I'm curious if this will help with some of that. And so I came, I pulled up some of the big changes that are happening. Oh. And let's talk through them. I don't really know that much. Open gaming license are changing with D&D. &D, so they're starting to allow more fan created stuff into the world. That's great. That was one of the big issues that 4th edition, in my opinion, didn't take off is because they became very insular with 4th edition. No one could create 4th edition content and it completely killed everything yeah. with D&D. &D. It would be hard to create 4th edition content because there is a lot of math and logic that goes into building at wills and encounters that's, and all of that stuff. Yeah. That's very true, but they like legitimately pulled back the license completely. Like no one could create it. And I think that yeah. really hurt because you have people like Cobalt Press, you have whatever who who does Pathfinder? Uh Paizo. Paizo. I mean, they've started creating fifth edition Pathfinder books, you know? And it just opens up the door for so many people to experience this rule set when you're not restricted to buying Wizards of the Coast content. And then when you come in and you're like, oh, I actually really like 5th edition rules, you have another person who's going to be purchasing your product. So I, I don't know. I feel like opening up the license is... Does that mean Paizo bad. is leaning on 5th edition more than Pathfinder 2.0? No, they're still mm. very invested I'm in 2.0. Because sure. I think they actually are basically saying we are going to keep... Pathfinder 2.0 is going much more the direction of, hey, if you really like 3.0 and 3.5 and want it refined, we're going to go that direction. And so we're going to create the ability to do some of the wonky, crazy shit, but hey, you better have a master's in mathematics to support it, albeit not as bad as it was in Pathfinder 1. Uh, so like that actually offers a ton of that flexibility. And I was having this conversation with somebody a couple of days ago specifically on that concept, where 5e has gotten much more, we're going to pull back on the rules, we're going to pull back on some mm -hmm. of the crazy shit, allow, focus more on bringing in new players, having good roleplay mechanics, having good options there, without a structure around the really wonky shit you want to do. You can still technically do that in 5e, but you're going to have to home write a lot of it. Right. Or read Pathfinder 2.0 and steal it, which works too. Okay. Um, of the gaming license, my only like two cents on that that I do run into is I this... In the 3035 world also, you ended up with like such a bloat to the same problem, which you can cut out a lot of it, but it becomes kind of tough to like balance some of that stuff out. And this, oh, outside company creates this thing and players want to use it. And you have to look at it and say, is this balance or is this not? Because it's not actually from Wizards of the Coast, you can run into that problem a lot. And if you go into like the D&D wikis and look at homemade content, so much of that is so poorly done. You almost need, and <clears throat> Wizards of the Coast may moderating yeah you would need like a, a stamp of certification of like the wizard nice. of the coast certifies this fan content as being balanced or appropriate yeah, we think it fits within the world well and i think i think there's a difference between someone who makes a homemade class in their basement you versus, up versus someone like cobalt, cobalt press, press who sub, who creates an entire book that's hardbound that is released yeah. in a gaming store um i purchased the monster hunter <laughs> It was a Kickstarter. I don't remember. It's a. It was like a Monster Hunter conversion for fifth edition rules. They came up with new classes. They have monster hunts. They have like skinning, crafting, all of that stuff that you would get from the Capcom video game Monster Hunter in Five E D and D. And something like that, I think, could be incorporated well mm -hmm. because they play tested it. Yep. It took them years to develop. It's it's like they're releasing a source book, just not under the Wizard of the Coast banner, and. I've seen with 5th edition that Wizards of the Coast can't even be the best arbiter of balance. So you have classes like the Blade Lock, which if you want to be a Gish sword and casting, there's no reason to go the Spellsinger. There's no reason to go the Valor Bard. If you want to do that, your best option every time is a Blade Lock or a Paladin Warlock. That's honestly that's a phenomenal point and something that I have complained about consistently, especially with older versions, is like D and D's balanced up to like the first ten levels. And then after mm -hmm. that, I mean, I know enough math and statistics to realize like, hey, you guys did not think this through past level ten. Like you didn't think it through at all. When a single individual can one shot or in a single round can kill your top level boss boss monster. It's just not going to fly. And frankly, even 5th edition, if you look at the numbers for a lot of the creatures that they have, it's the exact same problems. You can run simulations on it and see, yep, mm -hmm. basically my party can kill this creature in one round as long as we go first. Oh, you get one attack off. Maybe you kill one guy. Fine, whatever. The other ones just kill you in a second. So. Well, on the flip side of that, Ranger Beastmaster. 
Yeah. Okay. I haven't actually looked before at it that the, much, but I heard before that the change. Well. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think the change has helped us so, too much. That's a really good call, and it's unfortunate also for the DMs that it's just like you have to kind of step in and sort some of that out, or you just have to let the players deal with it, which is fine too, just to a degree, but you don't want players being, you know, disenfranchised because of that. Right. So one of the next big changes is the clerics are not going to get their subclasses until the third level. That actually makes sense to me, in my opinion, because if you have a group that starts at level one, I hate... Hate's a strong word. I dislike building my character out to level 20 because it doesn't allow for variance based on the campaign. What happens you, along the way? What's happening along the way should affect how your character is being built. It, If you're a cleric, it makes sense that you're choosing like your deity right away, but maybe not your domain, or maybe not the specialties that you're going into because you don't know what's going to happen to you when all of a sudden your character who's been in a temple all day goes out into the world and starts, you know, when murder hoboing people or fighting orcs or, you know, looking at dragons, like that's going to affect somebody on a very personal level. And even on top of that, like, okay, if you're a cleric and hypothetically you choose your deity and you realize, like, especially as a player, you realize, like, you know, I don't really, I like, I want to lean much more into physical combat. I was originally thinking this character was going to be healer and I was going to worship whatever the D&D god is appealing or whatever. But then you get into that combat side, like, no, I really like to be up there. That it allows you to basically argue, okay, level three, my character is now converting to be a cleric of Thor or Kord or somebody else's warlike. The other changes with clerics is you're now having the ability, you select a holy order. And the holy order... At level three or level one? At level two. Okay. Holy orders are going to be, at second level, clerics can, you can choose scholar which improves arcane and religion thaumaturgy which is improved spell casting protector which gives you heavy armor and martial arts so you do have a little more flexible even with what i was just talking yep. about. yeah so at second level you you're going to select a holy order you're going to then say i'm moving this way but then now in third level you're selecting a subclass and pairing the holy order in the subclass you now have a direction of that cleric of who that cleric is right and the direction, and like the rules that you're going to live with inside that cleric. Yeah, I definitely like that. So that's a that's a big change to the cleric side of it. Yeah, I think it's a welcome change because it does make sense that now classes are getting the big milestone at the same time. Yeah. Clerics are one of those classes that can be anything. Like, you can build a cleric to be a tank. You can build a cleric to be extremely squishy and a master caster. Mm -hmm. A cleric that's a, a healer. A cleric, I mean, yeah. clerics are like, very flexible. A lot like bards. Yeah. The most, one, or well, in my opinion, probably the most broken class in 5th edition. Clerics? Bards. Oh, bards, yes. Yes. Um, this is the, I think, the controversial one. Spell lists are being reorganized and restricted. Spell lists are now going to be primal, arcane, and divine. That's mm -hmm. it. Oh, really? So there's not going to be a difference between mm -hmm. sorcerer versus wizard spell lists? Versus, or, versus warlock? Uh -uh. I, I feel like you have to do something with it. I know that that's what the headline is, but because Warlock, you can break the game because you get that refresh after an hour. Well, and I think I'm not sure if this is actually true, but I because they haven't released the Warlock to my knowledge, but I think our Eldritch Blast is, be Eldritch Blast is becoming a Warlock ability, ability specifically, yes. as opposed to sense. a selectable spell. Since like everything or half of their shit builds off of Eldritch Blast. Right, but that's then true. you also don't have clerics. Fighters, whoever, taking magic initiate, choosing Eldritch Blast because the best cantrip hands down, and then going from there. Because 1d10 force damage without any of the buffs that a warlock can give. At 120 is, feet. At 120 feet is not going to be resisted by a lot of things. Level one with no buffs. Yeah. Yep. You can't. Re there's not a lot of things that can resist force damage, and it's a 1d10, which is one of the outside of I think. Uh, what's the death one? Ring the bell, toll the bell. Oh, toll the, toll the, de toll toll the dead. Toll the dead. Which is a 1d8 or 1d12 if you're 1d12 if you're hurt. And it's a wills. But 1d10 consistently, I think, is the highest cantrip damage yeah. over the course of time. I can definitely see because that. Because I ran into that with Tiny, my halfling, when I was doing Arcane Trickster. My bow shot not as far as an Eldritch Brawl. Mm -hmm. oh. Why would I use my bow if I can... Dex bonus, but yeah. 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 So, I, like, I see what you're coming Yeah, from. I mean, it, it was just... So I think that's... Yeah. More to come on that. I know they haven't released everything, but it, well, on the fence with that one. We'll I'm gonna be, games. I'm gonna be the person continually touting fourth edition because fourth edition broke down the classes by primal, arcane, martial. You know you have a problem. And right? I actually <laughs> liked the distinctions between them, 
And I personally like it when there's more restrictions on the spells that you get as a certain class, because if you don't, every class is going to choose the same really strong spells. I mean, and every caster is going to feel very samey. In my opinion, Primal, Arcane, Divine, is too, it, that's not enough. I think yeah. Marshall, like, you, you have to have, up, the list has, there's more of those. I, I personally am kind of in the same boat of, like, I actually like class-specific lists because I do yes. think that they make them feel a lot more unique. Having a little crossover between a druid and a ranger is one thing, but I would much rather have a ranger having spells that are super focused on hunting, hunting down the beasts and killing them of the wild to protect civilization, where the druid is much more likely to focus on the, I'm going to summon them and cater to them. Yes. Well, if you're a paladin, I mean, if you're, if you're just deciding if you want to choose paladin or cleric, but you have the same exact spell lists. Yeah. Why would you not choose a paladin? Nine level spells, but that's about. I mean. So yeah, I agree. I hope that they make some more distinguishes there. Races are now species. Uh, it's so, a word. Who cares? Yeah, I'm not gonna. I don't want to focus too much on that unless they're not really changing the mechanics. So. What well, this kind of goes into that they're not going to be. There's no bonuses with races. I. Which we've kind of already did that as a homebrew of. If you're an orc, you don't always do a strength buff. If you wanted to be a caster orc... My my argument was basically you'd have to justify it. Because I actually kind of like that if you guys meet an NPC elf in my world, they're going to be more nimble, more dexterous in general. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they're all... Obviously, you've got exceptions, but like a clumsy elf is going to be an average human as far as that. And I actually kind of like that as far as like the normal perceptions of, hey, we're just physically built better for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Dwarves tend to have more constitution. They tend to be more hardy. That being said, if you in my world you want to play a Dwarven Paladin, I can see how you could argue that Dwarves have a ton of wisdom or a lot of charisma because of the way that they exist in the world. I, I'm mixed on it. I understand why they're doing it. It's uh, My assumption, at least, is a lot of it is around like the min-maxing of like, oh, I'm going to make sure I play this race. It gives me a plus two to intelligence because I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a wizard. I would rather move away from that, but that's I, I'd rather just homebrew and not. Because the backstories are now what are going to give the mm -hmm. the, uh, the bonuses, the bonuses, and that's the bonuses, it. the skill proficiencies, the equipment, and well, the languages. That, that is the one thing I want to promote. Is normally what people are doing, they're saying, "I want to play this class," because they're like, "I want to cast spells or I want to yeah. fight up front." So they choose the class based on that. Then they look at the races and they say, "Okay, well, which race makes sense? What race makes sense for this class because it's getting a plus two in this statistic or this attribute?" Yeah, I <clears throat> personally tend to try and like overcome that by just playing by choosing like race class at the same time. But I've seen people, I've done it myself, where it's just like, "Well, how am I going to get the best highest number?" Especially with static, with static saves. Mm -hmm. static AC that 5e promotes you really, yeah. that plus one means plus a lot two, more plus, yeah. so we should race through some of these otherwise we're going to spend the rest of the day just yeah. on rules yeah. changes I don't um, want to get bogged down so sign language is now official perfect, okay. love it language. bards and rangers are now prepared casters bards and rangers are now prepared That's yeah. oh yeah, anything to tailor the how strong bards are Feats are revamped. So I do like that. I feel like the feats are one thing that they really did kind of lack and should have put a little bit more effort into because they they allow a ton of the customization that you options that you get. Making them optional, in my opinion, was a terrible idea because no one was no a lot of people are not gonna keep them optional. They they allow you to play in the game that does, yeah. Right. They and allow you for more real. customization. And the problem with feats and not having like level restrictions makes some feats sentinel very, very <laughs> strong. And some feats almost kind of worthless. It's, it's a it's a huge element that I feel like they that making it optional was pulling 5e way too far back and that we're gonna make it approachable for everybody. Mm -hmm. You simplified that one too much. The last one that I think is valid to talk about is level 20 abilities are getting new epic boons added. I like that. That's great. Because I think then you have a at that point to get the game 20 in a class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it will kind of do deal with some of the hey i'm going to take one level in warlock so i get access to elder's blast or one level in whatever i don't right. which i really don't like when people do that unless it's a very strong character driven reason yep. if you're doing it to min max fuck off with that stuff yeah uh okay D, D, D villains best villain to date 
so I do have one that I, I would come up for me, and it would be in your campaign, and it would be Osmodeus, the way that you presented him. So Osmodeus is obviously like a big name enemy, bad guy, and everything. In Shaw's specific campaign, he basically, like, sealed off hell from everybody. He pretended that the devils had been absolutely destroyed. He was currently off. Nobody could find him. It turns out later that we found out he was a black goat that was running around in the world. The reason that I like this specifically is that he, like, was willing to go to any ends to make the biggest possible scheme that no individual looking through their my minor 20-year lifespan of adventuring could possibly see all the moving pieces to it. And we had spent the entire campaign building up to thinking, oh my god, fucking Therizdun, this is the baddest motherfucker out there. Problems, he's doing everything. We're basically, all we're doing is we're delaying him. We're causing other problems to deal with his problem. Because he is the biggest issue by a lot. And so what happens is we get super blinded by this idea, and the reality is a lot simpler than that. In that Therizdun was already dead. Osmodeus had already killed him. We were sitting here just doing his shit to set up everything else for the guy, and we ended up walking right into his fucking hands. And the final reveal of this whole thing is we're worried about Therizdun. We end up getting yanked into hell, which we thought was sealed off. Turns out it wasn't. And we see Therizdun's head lying in front of us. We're like, wait, what? We've spent the last ten levels trying to thwart this asshole to find out that he's been dead this entire time, and Osmodeus is standing in there over his dead body, and we go, oh, now we fucked up. We fucked up bad. We missed it the entire time. We thought this entire thing was going on. In reality, we were being played. We walked right into his fucking we walked right into his fucking hands, and now we gotta fight Osmodeus ascending to God. And to me, that was just like the perfect, like that moment of us getting pulled into hell was just like, oh God, what have what have we fucking done? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's exactly kind of like how I love to see Osmodeus. So you can't see everything that's going on. And there were times that we even called out. We know this is a bad idea, but we don't know the option to get around it. So we're kind of backed into a fucking corner of thinking, we're going to do what we think is best in the short term, and then we're going to have to kick that can down the road and sort out the long-term problem because we just don't know how to beat this guy right now. Yeah. And to me, that was a great portrayal. It was super fun. It was one of the ways I've ever seen Osmodeus characterized in a DD and d session that I really, really liked because he played us so well. Which, he's Osmodeus. He fucking should play us. Mm -hmm. He has an... an an infinite lifespan of experience screwing with people, and we have, you know, our 30-year-old characters that have only been adventuring for the past 15. What do you got, John? I'm going to defer to you quick. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Mine... <laughs> but that's high praise, man. Dude, that was, you did a phenomenal job with Osmodeus and that whole campaign. Mine would be... It's, it's a little bit different in the sense of... He didn't have a great, like, ending or outcome. Mm-hmm. But the Eldritch Knight in your group... Oh, Deirdin? Not, not Deirdin. Oh, Elliot? Elliot <laughs> was like this fear thing that we had this entire group for so long of running into this Eldritch Knight. He kicks our ass. He escapes. And then we finally run into him to go, hey, we're going to end this. And he's at a bar drinking... <laughs> Basically saying, yeah, the world's coming to an end. I don't know why you guys want to. If you want to kill me, we fine. fucking have at it. Like I, we're all dead anyways. And it was, we were thinking he was part of. This kind of goes back to what you just said of something's going on over here, but really it's over here. We thought that this Elder's Knight was part of this huge giant scheme, and he was he was, if not the guy running it, if not you know maybe a high general, but he was just a. One of the another pawns in the world, and he realizes at the end. Yeah, and so when we came into, I don't even think we killed him. We were like, "No, you let him go." Oh God, like this is. So a little background on that on that NPC specifically is he was part of an order of eldritch knights that were supporting this guy who had slaughtered a bunch of gods like millennia ago. So an eldritch knight was the highest level of this group, and he kind of ran the show. But the way I kind of built him is he's a little short sighted. He was super powerful individually, but he didn't actually have the broad spectrum of plans going on. And when you guys met him the first bunch of times, he kicked the shit out of you because he was like level 14 at the mm -hmm. time. When you met him at the end, he was still level 14 because he'd been so disillusioned and you guys are like 16, 17. And when they did finally encounter him, he had realized that the original head of this order that he was supposed to be protecting is basically trying to slaughter all the gods and seal off the world from it. And he's like, this could be like world ending. And also there's a dead god on our plane He's going to, like, ruin everything, kill all of us to achieve his goals, and he doesn't care. And I've been serving this guy, like, my whole life. I've realized it now, and I realize the fertility of everything I'm doing as this kind of, like, machinations are going on, and he became super disillusioned. You guys met him when he was drunk and was, like, giving up. He's like, if 
fuck it. Everything's like, they're literally, this is the apocalypse that is going to end the world as we see it. And also, I've been fighting for the guy who did that the last time. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. hey, I'm glad he liked him. I had a lot of fun creating that character, and I wanted it to be not like, oh, he is the big bad evil guy. It's like, oh, no, he's just another schmuck. Like you said, they kind of got played and realized it. And what he did, he's like, well, now I'm fucking depressed. And I don't have a way of fixing what I've done, or even just what's going on in the world. He didn't have the fortitude to stand up and actually solve those problems. Mm-hmm. That comes to me, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, unless there's another person at the table, yeah, I think it does. Yeah. I would say definitely. There's a few people from your campaign hitting both ends of the spectrum that would fall under the best villains to date. You think? Arenicus was amazing. Also, no relation to John Arenicus from Baldur's Gate. That was a complete times. accident. I swear to God, it was a complete accident. Yeah, we all believe. Fuck and off. <laughs> just. <laughs> Having him as that that future villain that we know is going to, is doing wonky shit, is you know creating all of this disturbances on your plane. We know he's the end goal, and I think having that in mind more so than the Elliot piece for me was because I wasn't really involved with all everything with Elliot was always where we were trying to get. The other, the flip side, the smaller end villain, Ansel Bro. I don't know if people would consider him a villain, oh. but his backstory, this is an NPC that traveled with the party from literally level 1 to level 20. He wasn't a villain, I guess, in a sense, when he was with us, but at some point you could say like his reason for being with the party, his reason for living was villainous, I villain. guess. Yes. So I'll kind of explain a little background on that, and I actually realized one other minor villain that I'm going to call out too, but that's a very minor one. So the background on Ensel was we created, I created this world again that had like three ages. The first one ended in apocalypse. The second one was the recovery from the apocalypse and kind of like the new gods coming to be. And I built it around a lot of like um, Norse, Egyptian, Greek mythology. So Ensel was a high level cleric at the end of the second age who was this physically intimidating beast who was like the healer of the party, but also kind of the one leading this like NPC group that existed a few thousand years back. The idea is they came up against the dragon god Io, who they were going to kill because he was the last of the old, old gods that was ruining the world. First age? Um, He was from the first age, but this is in the second age that it happened. So when they finally, they finally got to this dragon fight, he worships Hades, so god of death, so he's very much like a, I'm going to kill everybody and send you to my, send you to Hades because that is the natural order of things. But the way I did it is he, uh, the final fight, Hades realized that they were losing and he basically turned him into an avatar. Gave him Mm -hmm. as many buffs as he basically could, said, you need to kill this dragon or we're all fucked. Well, his response is in that exact same moment, he broke and he ran. As a result, the party did end up killing off the dragon, but most of them were killed or maimed that they would never recover and that they were basically all sold, but they did solve this dragon problem. So the punishment then for Ensel was, cool, when I gave you all of my power, you then took it, you broke, and you ran and became a coward. I am going to punish you for all eternity, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you this diminutive, physically weak individual, and your only role in the world is to support the people around you. Your job is to inspire them to the great things that you yourself could not accomplish, and you are going to actually, at some times, cause problems in the world so that the people you are supporting are going to rise up and face them. You are basically creating heroes that are going to live in Elysium for me. And that's kind of what Hades' goal in my world was. He wasn't actually an evil deity to some degree. And one of the things that I always took away from Ansel was with him actively healing, mm-hmm. he's doing the countermeasure of what he actually is keeping them away from Hades. Yep. And that's not what he wants to bury them to Hades. Hades. But by him being a healer, he was actively mm-hmm. like, I thought, I mean, I, I remember all of that piece of it, but to me, that was his true punishment was I, you are getting close to Hades. My job would be to usher you, you to away. Hades yep. and I actively have to keep you away. Yep. And it was, that would be awful. Yeah. And I, I liked the idea of just like his God hates him. He still loves his deity, but he realizes he's fucked up. And even they commissioned some artwork that had him in it. And in the final section of it, I actually cropped him out um, for one of the images, specifically calling out that everybody that was remembered for all the all the things they accomplished in my campaign, and he's off to the side and nobody remembers who he was. Because his whole thing is, you will never accomplish great things. You will inspire other people that will accomplish those great things. 
Um, so my last little bit on a villain, this is an incredibly minor one-up that my uh, a family member put together that I loved. It was a one-shot adventure that I did a long, long, long time ago. And it was, you, you end up taking this job for a guy who basically says, hey, I have a, I need the power, or I need the blood of a powerful magical beast, and I can use that to make, like, a equipment or an elixir or some bullshit that will help out, help you guys out. It's incredibly powerful, but the more powerful beast you kill, the better this thing, this elixir will be, and it will be, do great things. The party says, cool, that sounds like right up my alley. So they go out, they hunt down a monster equivalent of their level, and you can just pick anything out of the monster manual that, hey, I'd love to try fighting this creature, but I don't have a reason. Well, now you do. Mm -hmm. So they go they go there, they kill this creature, they get a, a vial of its blood, and they bring it back to this guy. This guy then immediately dumps it on something and locks the door to the room. In reality, what it is, is this guy is a complete, total, pathetic wastrel. His father was a genius who created the golem, and his golem is then powered by the blood of magical beasts, which is why he had to go kill it. So what he does, he has no clue how the golem works, he just knows if you pour blood on it, it turns on and it kills everything around you, because he long since lost the owner's manual. So he locks the door, ideally the golem kills the party, once it shuts, on, shuts down, he goes back into the room, takes all their stuff, sells it, and spends the next couple of years drunk. And the reason I love it is, A, he is not a mastermind, he's dumber than a pile of bricks, his father was a genius. B, I like those, like, minor stupid party betrayals, because I find players hate that more than people that want to ruin the world. Personally, betraying you somehow is a higher level of sin than I'm going to kill everything and destroy all of existence. So, it super is. minor. I just love that guy, and I love the fact that he's complete. And there's no there's no loot in it for you guys, which, as you remember, happened to be a theme of my last group. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I like, I kind of like that, yeah, you don't get anything, because he literally sells it to embrace his vices. He mm -hmm. just goes off and drinks and whores all day. So, Brian's creating a new world. SPQR. Give us the background of the prep. All right, so SPQR, for those of you that are familiar with history, um, that is Latin for basically the people in the Republic of Rome. So I'm setting it in an, a magical version of the ancient Roman Empire. This isn't a new concept by any measure, but that's kind of where I'm focusing. I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. A, I'm a huge history nerd, so I love this shit. B, my last group, what I found is I did a shit job of creating what felt like a cultural identity and feel in the world. And so it just kind of felt like cities you were visiting and like some of the people mattered. But I wasn't, I wasn't happy with the way that it came out. So I figured doing this, this is going to give me something that I already know that is like, here's the culture, here's the law, here's the rituals, here's the gods. Here's how the world interacts and like actually make it feel like a living, breathing world as opposed to a destination where you can go shop and maybe pick up a job or two. So I'm doing it post-death of Julius Caesar. A lot of changes, a lot of magic being introduced to the world. Also, the Romans specifically being masters of dispel magic and counterspell because they really happen to like their way of fighting on the ground. I think the concepts behind that will work really well. I've done a lot of unique build for individual races, like how they fit into the world and why. Prep is going pretty well. Um, I haven't leaned into it as hard as I could. I think I need to like actually just start. I have... The world built, I have a lot of like the first couple of sections. One of the things that I'm doing that I actually really like and I want to try and who knows, maybe it'll flop, is for every character, they're all getting like a mini origin story, which is like a couple hours session. And the reason I'm doing that is what I've found in the past is when you have five characters coming together, first time. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, most of the characters, they don't have fleshed out personalities because like you've written up a backstory, but you don't know how you're going to respond and nobody's like posed hard questions to you in a lot of ways. So this is designed to like, hey, I'm going to ask you, you're, I'm going to put you in a couple of positions where you have to ask yourself some questions of how does my character feel about A versus B or law versus whatever, chaos and about society as a whole. So the idea is it's supposed to flesh out some of those, kind of give you a little direction and then also have a combat or two so that you get a feel for how that character plays. Then when everybody finally shows up, they're all going to be level three. This is partially because all of these players have played a lot. You have a lot of years experience. You understand a lot of how like the game works. I don't want to go through level one and two. I want you guys to show up with like, if you have a backstory of your character being this great warrior, you're not a level one guy who dies to a peasant with a club. I don't really want that. How would you feel the prep is going for this compared to your original group? Is it, is it easier because you have an established world that you know a lot of? Yeah, I would say so. It's a little tough. Um, I had two assistant DMs when I put together my previous world, so a lot of ideas back then would kind of helped. The other thing is, as I when I ended my prior one, I felt a lot of burnout, mm -hmm. and I looked back at the stuff I created at the start of it, and I felt great about it, but by the end, I felt like shit. 
I'm a little on the fence with it. I feel like some things are not flowing as well as I'd like, but I have been just like recording more notes over the course of time. It has been tougher. The world portion of it has gone really well. The Your Adventure arc is the part that I'm having a little bit of trouble with, but I think part of that is I'm focused. I'm doing too much of it right now rather than give you guys the first like four or five sessions, let it grow itself. I have my end point, but I'm missing a lot of that arc in between. You and I talked about this mm -hmm. a couple days ago, where the same thing with, with Elon, for me, my D&D group, it's having those four moments that you mm -hmm. want to capture, yep. and building to those moments you can't plan for. I yep. mean, like, you, you can say, hey, this session, based on what happened last session, I want him to do this. I kind of want him to be here, but based on what the group does, it might go. I know I want to get him to here in this moment, mm -hmm. but how you get to them. Um... Yeah, definitely. And one of the things that I did in my last one that I was very, very, very happy with, but I felt like supported the concepts that I was going for as a whole, is at the start of it, in the like first three sessions, you guys had hints dropped for you for the end. Yep. Now, you don't know it at the time, but it allows me to make sure that I keep that along the way that you can see when random shit happens, you guys visited a town that did, like, human sacrifices to a dark god and you had no clue. Turns out that was the final god, but you just didn't know it at the time. Yep. But the idea, I, I really wanted to kind of have some of those flashback moments of, like, oh, this thing that made no sense. Like, this PC or this NPC was doing something really stupid. No, they weren't. They were actually achieving another goal. You just couldn't see behind that veil yet. I want to make sure I still capture some of that. And that's kind of my worry if I don't have some of those points as well defined as I do right now. And that's, that's one of my hangups. I think I can get there, and I think it'll be fine, partially because I'm going in such a different direction this group than my last one, but yep. I do have a lot more prep I need to do. I think the and Jake and I were talking about this a few days ago, I think hints along the whole, the whole campaign are very important. Mm -hmm. And I was, just to call back to the Osmodeus villain, I was giving hints the entire campaign. I complained a lot thinking I was giving too much up the entire time. Nope. But I started with very subtle hints of, okay, for some reason, there's no more devil blood on yep. the plane. There's only tieflings that are demonic in origin. Yep. Something's going on there. Then all of a sudden, you start meeting this black goat who you find out later is a devil. Oh, you find out even later, oh, it's Asmodeus. Then you find out, oh, I got to get these certain little quest key points that, you know, funnel power from the gods into you. Eventually, you know, with little devil hints, little Osmodeus hints throughout the whole campaign, eventually it became so plain, well, I felt so plainly obvious where it was Osmodeus telling you, you need to go to Celestia, you need to kill Bahamut, you need to get me this thing. Mm -hmm. Where you knew at that point, like you were saying before, we this can't, is a bad idea. we have to do this. We're we, so, yeah, we're backed into this we're corner. We're backed into this corner, but it went from like one out of ten hints to plain plainly obvious at this point. There's nothing you can do, but here's a blatantly obvious hint. Mm -hmm. yep. This is who is gonna be and this is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do agree, and I like that quite a bit. And it's always funny as a DM too, because even in my prior group, I felt like I was dropping these as like, hey, here's a big old red flag for you to look at. And like, eh, that's kind of a yellowish flag. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, but from a player it's so much harder because you're you're not connecting the things that, you, as a DM, you're automatically connecting in your mm -hmm. head because you built them that way. And it might seem super obvious, and it's probably never as obvious as you think it is. That's true. And that I ran into that same thing a well, whole ton. I know you ran into the same thing. I'm kind of running into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fun fact, so I'm assistant DMing his Elon group because I live out of state. And when he's he's talking about let's do this, that, and the other thing, I'm just like, yeah, that makes sense. And then, like... After the session, he'll be like, well, the players went and did this other completely different one-off thing. Like, they completely missed this, like, glaring, huge, obvious hint right in front of them because they didn't even think about it from that perspective. Yep. They thought about something completely different. And it's like, let's just give information to the fucking death black knight. guard death knight. Who's a death yeah. knight? Who has said he's a death knight? Yeah, he hasn't even been subtle about no, it. No, no. Like, oh, let me just, like, spoon-feed this guy well, all the information that we have. gave the Azamar a sword... He's like, oh, you killed this. You killed the guy that had the sword, which was an imp. Hey, yeah, that was yeah. mine. Go ahead you and can keep, keep it. it. Like don't, he, don't keep it, dude. It's like a he, bad idea. He, he is. So. so yeah, I don't know why they like that guy as much as they do. So I'm sure at some point G will listen to this and you know have some conversations. But whatever, it's neither yep. here nor there. Um, moving out of the D and D realm and going okay. into board games as a whole, 
What were the top games that you played this year? Board games. John can't choose God tier. Hmm. I don't know what game board games I've played up in God tier this year. Wingspan is very fun. It's it's it's. I've seen that uh, at the source and yep. Green Vault. I have picked it up like four times and read the back and I have set it back down. You cl- literally just collect different types of birds. You have them lay eggs and the person at the end with the most eggs wins. Yeah. I mean, but it's it's nice because you get to see a bunch of different types of birds from all over the all over the continent. You learn a few things and it's actually pretty fun. So I would suggest that. Um there's a nice two player game, so my wife and I play a lot of games and she won't play God Tier with me. So we need two player games that are pretty easy to pick up and play quickly. Uh we have Jaipur, which was really fun. Yeah. And we have the two-player version of Catan. So Jaipur is like a a barter and tr- like a barter and trading game. You have a certain number of resources in your hand. You buy certain resources from that are worth different amounts of points from you know the dashboard in front of you. And at the end, whoever has the best most resources wins. It takes about ten minutes. It's only two-player. It's very quick and easy to learn, but it's there's a lot of strategy involved with like the purchasing. And then two-player Catan is like regular Catan, but with cards instead of like a board game. And you still do the whole, you know, building settlements, collecting resources. Um, The nice thing is that it's pretty quick again. You know, it only takes about 15 minutes. And if you want to, you can play two, three games, and each game feels pretty unique. Hmm. What are you buying? I'll be honest, I don't know how many... Every board game that I've played, I've basically played with you guys, and it's yep. been 99.9% God tier. Um, <laughs> I think the, the obvious choice would be Bardsung. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about um, that. But I think Coup, for me, oh. I know that's not a new game, but Coup was an outstanding game to play with a group of people. That was a nice, like, and that was, we played Quick. that after d d It was like mm-hmm. a cool-down game, let the DM, like, relax a bit because he's been yes. running around like crazy. Who I thought we probably put a lot of hours in, and it's just one of those... We had a lot of fun with that one. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a lot of... What games do you want to play next year? I'll start again. I have one game that I have the boxes for that I haven't even read the rules yet because it took two years to get from the Kickstarter, the Darkest Dungeon board game. I have that plus the Crimson Court expansion. Um, the Kickstarter took a while to get to everybody. Then there was some sh- ship- shipping snafus where they were asking for extra money, but that's neither here nor there. I have it in my possession. I haven't read the rule book. It looks very complex, so I'm not quite yeah, ready to dive into that cool. yet. But we're it's... supposed to play that this trip. Yeah. Well, we should do that tonight. I you should pull that. I out didn't tonight. bring it. Oh, you didn't bring it. I didn't even have time again. to read the rules, and the rule book is like. Uh, well, I mean, actual shit, man. Book. Just put it on the back of the toilet. He'll read it. It'll be done by the next time we see him. I was just, <laughs> I want to play that next year for sure. It's going to happen. I just All have right. not been ready to dive into. We got we to gotta set aside some time yeah. for you. Dark is All right. Play more next year. I mean, I definitely want to continue the Bard song. Yeah. I definitely want to start mm-hmm. my D&D group and do more D&D in general because I know you're going to be busy and you're not going to be able to DM as much coming mm-hmm. up because Master's Program. Um, and then I'm not playing in yours, but I do like assistant DMing. But yep. I do want to do that, um, and I think hopefully do it a mix of in-person as well as remote because I want to do that downtime structure. I think that would be a lot of – that would be good. Want to do more God tier. Definitely want to continue Bard Song. Yeah, yeah I'm – Bard Song and D and I think, are my two going into next year. Darkest Dungeon does very much interest me, though, because that'll come up in later here. Oh, yeah, I want to check that one out. Um, God Tier. So we've referenced God Tier a number of times, which is a board game by Steam Forge Games. It's very well done, interesting, great minis. I will. That being said, I will pass it off to Shaw because he's a resident God Tier expert. I wouldn't say expert. He's okay. Only ranked fourth. Yeah. What do you? Third or fourth in fourth tournament in play? World. I fluctuate between yeah second two second and sixth. No, but yeah, it's a it's a miniature war game. I'm guessing a lot of people haven't heard about it. It doesn't have the biggest following, but it is very good for an intro board game. And even though the rules are very streamlined, they're very easy to understand. The strategy involved with winning 
is very complex. So the rules are, like I was saying, at face value, you know, not complicated. You're not pulling out rulers to get distances. You're not rolling 15,000 different dice trying to, you know, get explosions or not explosions or different <clears throat> different levels of hits. I mean, it's very, very simple and rules. We're not pulling out the rule book to look stuff up no. pretty much ever, even since we started. Right. You do a few times early on, but that's it. You, you're describing... Uh... Parks and Recs, the Cones of Shire. The Cones of Dunshire? Dunshire, he has like the whole, like 40 dice and he throws them on the ground. Oh, like, God. extremely comp. My, my miner's going to the devil, <laughs> which is then going to the field. Like, yeah. It's it's the opposite of that. Yeah. But the, the crazy thing is, in my mind, is that all of the champions are so unique. And even though the rule set is very simplistic, it has a lot of strategic depth. And that depth comes through the actions that characters or that your champions can perform and what actions they can perform with the other champions that you have so that you can create different strategic outcomes in this wargaming scenario. Um, so it's more about synergy. There's a lot of synergy involved. I mean, you have your, your strong champions that will be strong by themselves, but... My idea of synergy was just play all the undead creatures. Oh, yeah, there's always that, too. <laughs> there's always that. Treats me well so far. Um uh, I think I think that in any war game, just to keep it broad, leveraging percentages on what you're doing, plus focusing on objectives versus rule of cool in war gaming is very important. Yeah. So if you have in God tier specifically, there's this banner game where your champion can place a banner which will get you points at the end of a certain round. Now, obviously, it's more fun to go somewhere to kill somebody or to get into that combat scenario with the followers, the minions, or other champions. But you got to think long term. What is this? What is the board state going to look like? You know, next turn, the turn after. If I give up this round, what does that mean for next round? So, just in any war gaming scenario, you always want to leverage your percentages and make sure that you're not only thinking of current state but also future state. That should be plainly obvious. Who's I don't your... think we need to spend too much time on God Tier just because I don't think it's very popular. Who's your favorite character? Oh, Jean, Jean. for sure. Jean is a goblin samurai who you look at her card versus other cards and you would think, okay, this person is very weak. But the reason why she's my favorite character is because <clears throat> in any situation, and this is why I think, just kind of relating it back to D&D, wizards for a full campaign are a lot more fun than fighters. Jean is a lot more fun than certain characters of her same class because she has options. She has adaptability. Yes, she doesn't maybe hit as hard as somebody of the same class, but what you can do with her far outweighs what you can do with like it's just a straight, you know, brute. To kind of expand on that as Shah's regular opponent, since he plays Jean all the fucking time, is like most most of the time when you're facing a lot of these champions, it's like, oh, this champion's gonna move up, it's gonna attack, it's gonna maybe do this buff. With Jean, it's just like she's got a bunch of like randomness in there. It's like, oh, well, she can move in a couple of different ways into a couple of different like uniqueness of those attacks. And then it's like, oh yeah, she can only move three. So if I'm four away, and then next she, she moves seven, and you're like, what the fuck did I not account for? Mm -hmm. Because she has a lot of that like flexibility and adaptability. It makes her really tough to play against. It's also really fun to play against, but tough. Uh, yeah. Her decision tree is a lot larger and more broad than someone who's more straightforward. And I think that's what leads me to liking her a lot more. So John, with a god tier win yesterday, what's next in your tournament? So I'm currently in an objective hex tournament, I think eight or nine or Marty's championship. I'm not 100% sure. Steam Forge sponsored tournament online with people all across the globe. I just won the semifinal match yesterday and we'll be moving into the championship. Um, what I expect, looking at the other two people that need to play their semifinal match still, I'm expecting the person with the, the quote-unquote god-tier power picks to win his match. So I'm guessing I'll be facing the team that has three of the OP champions in the final match. And what I'm going to do, since we get a ban is ban out the strongest champion that I don't like playing against and then try to come up with some sort of strategy to get around how insanely strong his other champions are going to be in combat. So for anyone that has actually played God here, what champions is that person bringing? Uh, I expect the person with Kaelin, who is a Maelstrom Centaur, 
with ridiculous combat stats. Uh, to be on his team, Wraith Marid, who doesn't have the best combat stats, but can move anybody on the board to where he wants to. His followers move people around. Wraith has an ultimate ability that you can only use once per match that essentially repositions everything on the board. Uh, he has Rangosh, who thankfully recently, due to was the premier slayer, slayer being a champion that focuses on killing other champions, he was the premier slayer for a very long time, but now, with the recent string of Steamforge games, god tier champion releases, oh, just put a sentence, we're seeing a lot of high dodge, low armor, which means they're better at. I mean, it's it's plain play. It's, it's it's easier to kill them when they're when they get hit. Rangosh doesn't have the best accuracy, but he does a butt ton of damage. So now that Steamforge Games is releasing a lot of high dodge, low armor champions, it's easier to avoid his attacks. Thus, he gets to new, do no damage. So his power rankings have been going down, but you still have to account with account for how strong he is as a champion. So, Kaylin, Wraith, Marid, Rangosh is what you're expecting? Is what I'm expecting. But I'm going to ban out Kaylin because she's absolutely ridiculous. And the person I expect to win is the biggest proponent of the character, Maxon, who you never see in any lineups but his. And he brings him all the time. He's a dwarf who's very slow, but can attack you from three hexes away whenever he wants. Um, I expect him to be on the team as well. I don't think we really need to spend too much time on this, but we'll, the championship match is, is going to be something to think about for sure. Okay. We'll, we'll prep for it. We'll <laughs> yes. A couple of games. Um, board games aside, 2022, we played a lot of video games. No. Elden Ring just got the award of the best video game, or video game of the year by 2022. What was your guys' video game of the year for 2022? Ooh. Favorite of 2022? Just video game of the year for you of 2022. I mean, I played a shit ton of Warhammer 3. Um, mm -hmm. It is my most played game on Steam by quite a bit now, actually. So that would definitely be up there. Elden Ring I did like a lot, but as, I mean, I actually prefer other games in the Dark Souls series over Elden Ring. Well, I think it is great. I think it is a masterpiece. I really do think that there's some stuff that I would prefer that they clean up that makes that, that would make the game a lot better. Um, yeah, so probably probably Warhammer 3 or Elden Ring for me. I agree with... I thought Elden Ring, with it being a masterpiece, it was a wonderful game. I put hundreds of hours into that game and have recently picked it back up. I thought it was the first game in a long time to come out that was good and polished at release, and I think that helped with its success. I think my video game of this year was Cult of the Lamb. Hmm. I right. yeah. I absolutely loved Cult of the Lamb. I thought it was, and it was not polished at release. It had a lot of bugs, and the bugs frustrated me. I would set it down for five minutes, walk upstairs, go, I'm going to go do something else, and five minutes later, I would be back <laughs> downstairs playing Cult of the Lamb, and it was... it. One of the best, to me, it was one of the, a, the game I haven't done in a long time was pick up a game and beat it in like a week. And I did that. Um, and I go back every single week and look at Call to the Lamb to see, have they dropped any new content? Have they done anything? <laughs> Just because I want to go back and play it again. I experience that. And I think Call to the Lamb for me would be my 2022 game. Mm -hmm. All right, Sha. I mean, mine is Elden Ring. But I've had this weird path of how Elden Ring became like, became <laughs> this game of the year for me. When I first started Elden Ring, I was of this mindset of, I'm not going to look at any guides. I'm going to experience this myself. I don't want anybody to tell me how to beat bosses, what's up with the lore, all of that. I was going in completely blind and playing it from start to finish. Oh, wow. <laughs> very, 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 very like, you know, I'm doing this myself. I finished that playthrough. By the end, I was so completely burnt out with that game that I just asked Brian and another one of our friends, Lee, to come in to finish the final boss because I was, I didn't know why I was fighting him. I didn't understand what was going on in this world. I didn't care. I was completely underleveled. I was playing a build that honestly was 
absolute shit at the time. I don't know with recent buffs if it would be better, but it was bad. Like fist weapons and light or holy damage, if that means anything to somebody and watching. A little context around the whole summoning people in for the final boss, because a lot of people summon people in in Elden Ring. When Shaw played Dark Souls 2, his primary run is he instantly went and joined the Covenant of Champions, where you can't summon anybody else into your world and it makes everything stronger. So he really like leaned into that, I'm the man and I'm going to go do this shit by myself. So for him to summon someone in on Elden Ring for the final boss, to me instantly said, oh, you're you are not happy. You are not no. enjoying this game at all. You are legitimately pissed and this should not be a thing. The way I went through my first playthrough of Elden Ring, I, like I said before, I had no idea what was going on. And that just completely negated or just completely took away my my want and need to progress in that game because nothing made sense it was just like okay fight for a big ass open world that seems empty fight a bunch of things get to this boss kill it go to the next thing and the problem with elden ring versus like dark souls series at the time was that the bosses were very very spread out they were like end game bosses for each major area is what i what i felt like so it just it just it wasn't clicking for me Recently, I've reinstalled Elden Ring, purchased a strategy guide, and followed the strategy guide to the T. Everything makes so much more sense. Yeah. The story makes sense. <laughs> the way I'm going through the world the makes, sense. makes sense. The prog yeah, the progress makes sense. There's a lot more bosses that obviously I miss because I'm just not running into tombs or running into the areas that they they come down and they're like mini bosses, right? So I'm enjoying it a lot more for sure. It is the first game I've played in a long, long time that I feel like was designed to be for a wiki to be open or a strategy guide to be mm -hmm. with you because i do feel like the best content in that is absolutely it's not locked away but it's obscenely hidden to the point of just like i have zero reason to go explore this area other than the hope that maybe there's something in there but after you've done you know 15 of the different gray or um catacombs like yeah these 15 catacombs the first two were fun the last 13 all sucked I really don't want to go into another. They all look yeah. the same. And they all look the same. Yeah. A yeah. good example would be 30 hours into my playthrough, I was talking to one of our friends, Jeef, and he said, just change your Ash of, Ash of War. And I said, how do you change your Ash of War? I don't know how to do that. I know you can do it at, like, the Smith, but he's like, no, just go to the bonfire and change it. I was like, what are you talking about? So apparently... In that very one of the very first little like small settlements with a bunch of enemies, you can get the thing that allows you to change your Ash of War at bonfires. So I didn't know that. In a basement. Yeah. I missed that. Jake also said, what are you using in your physic? 20 hours into the game. <laughs> I said, what's a physic? <laughs> so I, he was like, you need to go here and grab this physic, which is another potion in the game that allows you to customize how you approach fights. So... You miss so many major items when you're really not looking at a guide that it really took away from my experience the first time. Yeah, 100%. What game in 2023 are you looking forward to? I'm not going to lie. I'm shit at following this stuff, so I have no idea what's coming in 2023. <laughs> um, you want to give us like at least a couple of top names? Is Hades lot... 2 coming out in 2023? If so, I believe that... so. Okay, it's Hades 2. Problem solved. Uh, for me... <laughs> With even with Diablo 4, which now I'm on the hype train about, even with Final Fantasy 16, which I'm on the massive hype train about, in February, Darkest Dungeon 2 comes out. Ooh, good call. And I am, I have, like you did with Elden Ring, I've looked at nothing, yep, haven't yep. played the early access. I am ready to play Darkest Dungeon again. I am looking forward to that game in February very much so i love the changes that they've the little i've seen the changes that they've done um and you just want to be punished again yeah. because that's what the first one did and i fucking love uh, that shit war tales is another one that i'm looking at i believe it comes out where it's a mercenary band that's an open world um for the pc so oh, i think that'd be fun yeah i think those plus the cast dwarves for warhammer 3 i'm looking forward to mm -hmm. So, Darkest Dungeon 2 is definitely up there. Hades 2, if it comes out in 2023, absolutely up there. Um, I did play, and Ryan, to be briefly jumping back to the, um, or sorry, 2023, jumping back to the ones I played this year, I did briefly play Bannerlord 2. I liked it at first, and then it felt like a grind and repetitive, and I stopped. I got really bored. I'm like, oh, this is just going to be 100 more hours of the same shit. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. So it's like, oh, and if you is. like it, 
Your life's gone. If yeah, you like it, I, your life is I got gone. super bored of the combat, and then it's just like, oh, I'm just going to keep doing the same shit. And there's, you know, your 10 quests that you can go on that you just mm -hmm. do each one of them 50 times. It just kind of got bored. Yes. But yeah, Hades 2, definitely up there. Darkest Dungeon 2. Hades, Hades 1 was probably one of my top games of all time, just for like the price point versus what you got out of it. I fucking loved it. Mm -hmm. um, any expansions to Total War Warhammer 3, I will always be about. Yeah. I'm on my fucking dozens Immortal Empire campaign and I've got nothing. I think. Baldur's Gate. That's what. I, that okay. Oh okay. shit! Yeah. yeah. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I think there's a discussion yeah, here Baldur's for maybe a whole podcast recording in itself of early access. Yes. If a game's in early access, I don't play it, and that includes Darkest Dungeon Two. That includes Baldur's Gate Three. I am extremely excited for Baldur's Gate Three. Yes. I. Love the first two Baldur's Gates. Recently tried to play Baldur's Gate 2. It was too old for me. Couldn't, couldn't get back into it. But I loved it when I played it the first time. Um, John Aronicus. It was Fuck nice seeing him again in Brian's D&D group. Fuck <laughs> off. Um, Accident. Yeah. Made by Larian Studios, who made the absolutely brilliant Divinity Original Sin. Divinity Original Sin 2. Which is um, still one of the best games of all time. I will die on that hill. <laughs> Adapting, obviously, 5e D&D rule set. From what I've seen... From in-game cinematics, from gameplay videos, because I just can't keep myself away. It looks brilliant. Yep. I'm very, very excited for it. Um, I'm also excited for Darkest Dungeon 2. I think that would probably be my second game that I'm the most excited for. And then a game that came out this year that I'm going to approach next year, hopefully with some major changes, Elix 2. going to get there. It's going to be great. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Do it. Like Donkey's Super Mario 2. <laughs> For you, <laughs> okay. So well, I'm gonna get a little sidebar here on Elix in case anybody who's played the game. No one's played it. I hope not. <laughs> well, the first one. Okay, so the first, first one was brilliant. The first game had like the is mechanically like the worst game. Oh, it's so bad. The combat is shit. But like everything was like meticulously like hand placed in the world. The concepts behind the world and like the story, all that was really good. And you expand throughout the game and you, like, I really liked it, even though the combat was utter trash and clearly unfinished. Whatever. Oh, yeah. Elix 2 was like, please guys, keep that, polish up the combat, get on a new system. And I was excited for it. In fact, like, I bought it at the same time as Elden Ring, and I actually started Elix 2 first, despite the fact that the Souls games are some of my favorite games. I get into Elix 2, I'm like, wow, you guys actually took a step backwards mm -hmm. in graphics. Your faces look much more like they're made out of clay than they did in the first game, but whatever. Let's go through it. Combat, yeah, it's really not improved. A little bit, but really not. The first the first act felt like Elix all over again. I was excited. I'm like, cool, we're doing stuff. You're learning about the world. Things are well-placed. We've got some cool missions, shit like that. By the end, I don't know if the devs just like, yeah, fuck it, we don't care about this. They ran out of money. They rushed, whatever happened. It went from, like, here's these cool, like, this is how the world interacts with itself and how factions hate each other and why they hate each other, too. Go kill 50 monsters with our shitty-ass combat system, and that's going to be your quest to end Act 3. Like, <laughs> it was so fucking terribly bad. I literally, like, I messaged Shaw at the time, like, I am struggling to finish this game, and I hate not finishing games. It bothers me. It sits mm -hmm. and, like, gnaws in the back of my brain. I was like, I'm doing this just to do it, but I hate this game right now. And to the point where I do not know if I will play another game by that studio because the back half of Elix 2 is one of the worst pieces of shit I've ever played. It was so bad. It, Don't do it. Dude. it you, I haven't started yet. You have a wife. Go spend time with yeah. her, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, what I want people to realize is, like, we enjoy games even with faults. Like, Absolutely. And, and we, we've had this conversation where the Witcher series, one of the best series ever created. The combat in Witcher is awful. I'm sorry. I do not think the combat in Witcher... When you play Souls games and you play other action games, you're like, this is what combat feels like. The Witcher combat is square, square, X, circle, potion, square, square, X. That is Witcher combat. It is awful. It is one of the greatest games of all time. That's fair. So, I don't think it's terrible. I just don't think it it's is good. good. And I fucking love Witcher 3 especially. I love all of them. I think Witcher 3 is... I think Witcher 2 is the best combat. Witcher 1's combat is... It's weird. It's taller. Some it's good. It. Some people I don't think it's, it's bad. And... I think it's on par with Witcher 3. Really? Yeah. I, I Witcher, Witcher 2 <laughs> combat, I think, is the best. 
It's part of that, I think, is also because Witcher 2 is a lot more limited. It's not open yes. world. So you're not fighting everything all the time, but But I uh I can put up with a lot of jank. I actually like a lot of jank. I I mean my favorite RPG of all time is probably Morrowind, so um I can I can put up with the Bethesda shitty combat the, system. Bethesda if it is the king of jank. Yeah. If <laughs> if the story, the lore, the writing keeps you lifts it up. Yep. You so know, don't play the back half of Elix 2. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh my god. Stop after 20 hours. The um, first act is good. It does exactly what you would want Elix yep. 2 to be, minus the fact that they didn't improve once. I go into souls for better combat, action combat with, you know, no story. Visual storytelling. True. I know what I'm getting when I go into certain games, and that's, like I said, I can put up with a lot of jank as long as I, I'm getting what I want from that game. I'm going to change up the next section a little bit. What was the top movie you saw this year? Mm. Top movie I saw this year? Mm -hmm. So I've recently gone... I watch a lot of movies. Yeah, no, like two I watch a lot of movies. And I have gone from being pretentious about oh my god look at this oscar amazing movie too at this point in life i just want to be entertained and i want to be surprised but he's still pretentious don't I'm let still that pretentious, get you. but i want to be surprised so legitimately the two movies that i think of off the top of my head that happened that did that in 2022 are malignant by james wan and barbarians written by the guy from whitest kids you know they're both horror movies and they both go in directions that I did not expect the entire movie, and I thought they were brilliant, brilliantly shot, and just a just a really fun ride the entire movie. I had no idea what was going to happen, and I loved it. Okay, Brian, fuck, I don't know, man. I don't watch a lot of movies, except when I'm with you goons. You might have to come back again. Oh, the Northman too. Uh, I mean, mine's the obvious answer: Top Gun. Maverick. Maverick. Yeah. yeah, was the to me. That was good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, that's down too. That's great. Okay, twenty twenty three goals. What do you got next year? In general, doesn't have to be video game. Mm. For me, I'm going to, I'm going to finish a book every month. Dang, mm, that's a that's fun. good. One. I'm going to finish a book every month, whether it's personal or professional. I'm going to read a book every single month. Means okay. I have to carve time every single week and just make it part of your schedule and make it part of your habits. Yes, I'm going to read a book every month. That's a good goal. I'm writing this down because I'm going to come back to it and I'm going to tell yeah, well, well, episode two will be you know this time yeah. next year. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the books that I read. Okay, next. Is that, <laughs> yep. Um, goals, I would say I have a lot based around like personal hobbies like Muay Thai. I've got a lot of stuff I want to accomplish there, but I'm not going to get deep into that. Um, I don't know. Maybe figure out my living situation if I'm going to stay in the state that I'm in or if I'm going to move somewhere else again. Probably going to move somewhere else again, but who knows? Are you going to stay in the country? Uh, is that the part that you're going to figure out? <laughs> so yeah, that's a large portion of what I need to figure out is I'm going to stay in the U.S. or I'm going to go somewhere else. I work remote, so I don't really give a shit. And, you know, there's a few other things with that. Definitely want to figure those out. I don't know. Maybe go on a date once in a while. That'd be cool. That'd be fun. Maybe put that as a goal. You got this. Uh, yeah, I, don't know. I think that's most of it. I, th I could should get something concrete, but I normally like I have like individual like minor. I do like individual like milestones along the way of like what I'm doing. I'm less worried about at the end of the year. Like here's my resolutions and here's like the concrete goals. Like I know the direction that I want to move in with certain things, and I want to make sure that that keeps going. But I don't want to like hey, this is the bar that I need to clear. I don't get motivated by that, and I don't really care about that. And I know they say, oh, you should always set goals. I don't like the idea of like, hey, I'm going to set this goal post because then when I hit it, do I move it or do I just like get lazy? I like to say I'm going to progress and improve in these specific areas that I'm going to focus on. That's yep. just me personally. John? Um, start off strong and maintain that strength through my master's program that I'm starting, my MBA program. Because you need really, more master's degrees. You're, right, you're yeah. Farm yeah, degrees. more enough. degrees. Um, and then, honestly, like I do some, I start out really strong every year with creating lists of all the movies that I watch, all the games that I beat, and then ranking them throughout the year. And I always fall off around like May or June 
because the list is so long that I hate restructuring the list every time I finish something. So maybe, hopefully, maintain that throughout the whole year. And by this time next year, I can answer, what's your favorite movie this year? I could whip out my phone, say, well, the num- one that I have at number one is this. You're going to have to scrape the Discord logs if you actually want to get yeah. to that. Because it's yeah. going to be like, hey, this is like, here are the five movies that you've watched recently or over the course of the hundred movies you watch over the course of the year that you can. No, I have, I have like a Google document that I've yeah, started. Yeah, you fill that out? Well, I, for part okay, of the year. Sounds, he kind of, starts it. Sounds like we need to scrape the Discord <laughs> yeah. logs and we'll just like pull that <laughs> out of your we'll conversations. Like, and then we'll just <laughs> auto-populate that list for you yeah. at the end. That'd be good for Oh, so I guess that kind of is like another goal on mine is I definitely want to get better at my job because I've been in my current role for eh, almost a year now and I'll be honest I feel like I'm done with a pile of bricks and I don't know what I'm fucking doing so like I definitely want to get better at that both with personal projects as well as what I do for living I'm gonna read a book every month dude that's a good one that's a really good one I'm just gonna try to she loves it has smart goals in it <laughs> smart goals yeah. good. leadership in this smart goals fucking executive leadership over here yeah yeah I'll try. No, I feel like I should just like pick up another program just so I can try to keep up with you with advanced degrees. I'm not going to because I'm never going back to school again. Fuck that shit. <laughs> my math is bad enough. I'm not going to. I mean, you can. You could. Do you remember how I said one of my goals was to get a date? If I'm over there like doing school full time, I guarantee it's not happening. It's the my school goal. that's keeping you from getting. Yeah, I, that's what I told myself. <laughs> yeah. The last two years. Yeah. Anyway. Well, so, that's it. Outro. Outro. I think we out. We out. Tro. I wanted to think of a controversial thing to say at the end to, to rile John up. Like, oh yeah, you should have done the, re- the last, the last three Star Wars movies were the best ones. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> See, and then then that will be the intro. <laughs> no one's gonna watch this now. Chief ain't gonna watch this. Are we paused? <laughs>